Hey everybody and welcome to this week's small group. You'll notice that I am not home. I am traveling in one of the glorious areas of Missouri, St. Louis, and I want to still get some content up. So let's start with this story as we delve into the Nag Hammadi scriptures. Two boys going on a trip. They're going to get manure, a fairly crappy thing to do. They're going to get it, taking their donkeys, and on the way they stopped. And they said, let's dig for some valuable treasure. And they did. And in finding so, they found a jar. And they said, well, we shouldn't open the jar. It might have gin in it. Now, some of you are thinking, if it has gin in it, we should definitely open it. You're thinking G-I-N. But I'm saying gin, J-I-N-N. Gin are spirits that might not be the greatest spirits in the world. It could be a little bit negative. But then they said, yes, yes, absolutely, there might be gin. But there also might be gold. And so they opened that as quick as open up McDonald's, you know, McRib, the best meal of all time, the McRib. And what they found as a result was they, all of these documents, these ancient documents, they couldn't read. They're in Nag Hammadi, Egypt, and they're looking through these documents in the 40s. And they said, what could these be? So like any good boy, they brought them home to their mom to figure it out. They said, mom, what, what are these, right? They could be valuable. They might be valuable. In fact, when they opened them up, initially some like uh, the dust that went into the air looked a little bit like gold. And they went back and the mom said, this is nothing. And they actually burned a few of them to warm their house, which we don't know what those were. Eventually, this would get into the right hands, and with a couple other discoveries in Egypt, they found that 13 of these texts were brand new, although there were a number of uh, them that they were aware of, but only because of folks who wrote against them. So Irenaeus was a person who wrote and said, these are heresies, and that was all they knew was that these weren't good, right? Like, and uh, instead, we found some really interesting insights into what early Christians believed. Now. A thing you might have heard, and especially if you grew up in the mainline church, is that, you know, uh, really we need to get back to our roots. If we just follow the Bible, we'll be good. Because the assumption is that all the early church believed the same thing. And they didn't at all. Instead, there was destruction, widespread destruction of these scriptures and trying to narrow it down. In fact, the reason four gospels were picked, uh, and really the only reason, wasn't because that they were the best or the most accurate, but well, we need four because, you know, there are four corners of the earth, north, south, east, west. And there's a lot of folks who will make justification for what ends up in the canon of scripture. But the reality behind it is there's a little bit of personality and a lot of ego that came into it. So when we review these, we're starting tonight with the wisdom of Jesus Christ. That's found on page 287 in the Nag Hammadi scriptures. We're not saying that these are authoritative, but what I am saying is I think they're worth exploring because many of these texts were in widespread use up to, the, up, up to Nicaea, which is the council which determined what scripture was going to be official and those that aren't. There were some that were in near universal use, such as the Gospel of Thomas, that were eliminated primarily because of ego. If you read Thomas, there isn't really a hierarchy, uh, and there's a lot of things in there that might cause challenges or difficulties with mainline Western faith. A thing to note before we jump in here too is people will say, oh no, this was, a, this was a marginalized group. It was really small. There were like six guys in a bedroom reviewing these. Not true. It was very close to being mainline faith of the Christian faith, like mainline. It came up to a point where two folks were essentially vying for Bishop of Rome, what we'd call the Pope today. Uh, and Valentinus, the Gnostic or wisdom uh, leader of which would be aligned with these kind of scriptures, lost and did not lose by a wide margin. Um, we don't know the exact voting, but let's just say we're talking like single voting, right? Why does this matter? These things present a very different view of life. And yet it actually adds importance of Jesus's life and death, but not in the way you'd expect. And, and one other note on this as we go into it is one to expect a huge cosmological change. What's cosmological mean? Your worldview after reading these things is going to be way different, way different. But your respect and admiration for Jesus, wh wherever it is now, might grow substantially. Because it's not as easy as Jesus came and died for your sins so you can go to heaven. It's way more complicated than that and way more impactful. And it makes his life more impactful 
than what I would argue Western Christianity does today, which is saying something. So with that, let's say a prayer, and I will introduce the wisdom of Jesus Christ. We are only going to go a little bit into it. And why only a little bit? Well, week to week, I'm going to do what I can prepare for. And right now, we're probably about that 10 to 15 minute mark of these presentations, because that's what I can do well. And I'm not going to give a crappy product to you, um, even though you get what you pay for, right? I mean, look at this. Ah, jokes aside, let's go into our prayer mode. Uh, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, the folks who found these scriptures, the people who had the courage to bring them forth, the courage to print them, and for what they endured. Many people who commented and uh, translated these were criticized heavily. So we pray that you guide us as we look through it, give us application, help us to appreciate you more. Amen. Okay, moving in. So we're going to start with the wisdom of Jesus Christ, again, found on page 287. The Savior, after he rose from the dead, his 12 disciples and seven women continued to be his followers. Okay, as you can see, we're going to fly through this. So the 12 disciples, I'm going to just list them for a second, and, and it is worth the listen. I'm going to point one out in particular. So you had Peter, James, John, Andrew. You probably know those if you're around in Christian land. Philip, Bartholomew, Bartholomew. See, there's low edit on this, guys. Matthew, Thomas, James, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Matthias. Now, many of you might not know Matthias. Um, Matthias, after Judas Iscariot um, did his thing, which, again, a very interesting take on his role in, the, in these scriptures, Matthias replaced him. He was voted in the book called The Acts of, Apo of the Apostles to replace him. Matthias has an interesting lineage. He essentially founded a branch of Christianity that was much different from what many folks were practicing at that point. That would become Gnosticism. Now, what is Gnosticism? It wasn't a label. It wasn't like people walked around and said, hey, I'm a Gnostic. They were Christians. That's what they believed. They just believed that in um, salvation wasn't simply coming into your heart, but that there was a knowledge piece to it, that we had to understand the mission and understand our relationship to the world and God. A good example of what Matthias did and what we're going to see today is if you've ever watched the movie The Matrix, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. There's a person, Morpheus, who comes to Neo um, and says, I've got a blue pill and I've got a red pill. You take the blue pill, you stay where you are. You take the red pill and you're going into Wonderland. And I will tell you this right now, for those of you who stick with us, this is red pill land. Not for other connotations or any other reason to note that this is showing a very different view of the world than what we've encountered before. And frankly, the Matrix movies in, the, in their entirety, all four of them, and the fourth one is pretty awesome. It's worth the two and three, which aren't that awesome. Uh, but the first and fourth are great. What you'll find in those movies, they're 100% based on these books. So if you've watched those movies and said, wow, I really resonate with this, it, it just it hits me differently. Uh, it's not that there's a quality behind the movie that's causing that. It's because this resonates eternally with your soul. This is written on your soul. Okay, so Matthias is somebody who's important to know. He's one of the 12 here. But who are these seven women? So you had Mary Magdalene for sure. Mary Magdalene's relationship with Jesus, we're going to develop as we go, but we'll say that it was a very deep relationship for sure. Uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, would have been here as well, so Mother Mary. Martha is suspected, so she's the sister of Lazarus. If you remember Lazarus, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. So Martha and Mary, both present. Salome, Salome who's the mother of James and John. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, and that was Herod's steward. Okay, so this is she's also mentioned in scripture. And then Susanna, and she's mentioned in, um, so, uh, as supported uh, in Luke. She was a very supportive person. So these are the seven women. Now you might say, okay, well, why even mention them? Who cares? Rather than go through each person's role right now, because they will surface as we go, and we'll bring, bring them up. The thing to note is in these scriptures, women are held to a much higher regard. Now, Jesus, everywhere he went, even in mainline Christian scriptures, he freed women. That's what he did. In the society there, um, women were not seen as a high class or uh, an equal with men. In fact, one prayer of the Fa Pharisees, who were a religious sect then, um, and I did not write this prayer. I just want to say that up front. I'm going to say it again because I don't want any notes. He said uh, they would go around and say, um, I pray you thanks, God, that I was uh, born a man and not a woman or a dog. Wow. 
right? Yeah, that's not going to win any favor. So um, didn't write that, just being clear. They just didn't have a good view of women. Jesus elevated women. He would talk with them. This was shocking to bring them up to a level of equality. These scriptures emphasize that action that Jesus took throughout his ministry. Uh, it certainly wasn't something that told women to sit in the back row or not participate. <clears throat> it's actually the complete opposite. And this is worth a sidebar for a second, because who doesn't need a good sidebar story? What got me interested in these scriptures after having traditional uh, faith background was reading about someone named Thecla. Thecla was a young woman who converted to Christianity and traveled with Paul, the apostle, on his entire missionary journey. She was with him the entire time. She would be martyred or killed by Emperor Nero. What's interesting is if you pull up just about any Christian history, and I referenced five before I make this comment, uh, the ones I've read, the ones I've studied, I have never heard of this woman before in my entire life. And maybe you haven't either. But if you go Google it now, because that's how we solve all our problems, or chatbot it now, um, you'll find that there are cathedrals all over Europe which are cathedrals of St. Paul and St. Thecla. But many of you won't have heard of her. Why? Because she wasn't included in scripture. She was edited out. Women were selectively edited out of scripture. They just were. Now, you're going to say, jump to some other conclusions with that. If you're someone from Western Christianity, say, well, wait a minute. These are inerrant, like the scriptures are without error. The truth be told is scripture is without error in its original form. That's what inerrancy says. The secret story is this, we don't have any in the original. So we don't know what they were, but we do know this, that Thecla traveled with Paul is an example, and she is nowhere to be found. That shocking discovery for me is what led me to really look at some other historical documents, things that aren't found in main, mainline Christianity. And frankly, it was infuriating more than anything because you spend years studying these things and to have people say, well, we don't wanna really tell you about it. And that goes with these scriptures. The reason they were destroyed was they didn't want you to be able to look at them. They said, no, we need to get rid of these because if we keep these included and available, people might think we don't want that. So we're gonna press on uh, for now. And sorry if it sounds a little angry, but there's a little bit of anger there. A little bit of anger, I guess, to deal with. Okay, moving on. They went to Galilee up on the mountain called Prophecy and Joy. Okay, so they're Galilee. I know, again, we're flying through this. On the mountain, prophecy and joy. Now, prophecy can be interpreted as divination or joy, or prophecy, so prophecy or divination. So this is likely Mount Tabor, okay? So Tabor is where Jesus transfigured. So if you remember at one point, um, he's up there with, was it James and John, right? Just making sure I was there, James and John. And he's up there and uh, he transfigures into light. And he has Moses and Elijah show up and Peter um, is there as well. And Peter's like, let me make some tabernacles for you guys. And uh, essentially he kind of missed the boat. It's where, where God comes in and says something, God the Father, like th this, is, this is something else is happening here, Peter. This is my son. Something is significant happening. And that's what Tabor is all about. It's this transfiguration, this knowledge that Jesus is something bigger, something brighter. And it's also a place of joy, not just of the prophecy of what Jesus looks like in the future, this light walker, this person of pure light, but of joy because he's fulfilling both the prophets, which is symbolized by Elijah, um, and the law, which is symbolized by Moses. So he's fulfilling those requirements of, of the law. Again, very joyful, and because God comes and says, this is my son, um, it's fulfilling the sonship, that he has this unique relationship with God. Continuing on, as they gathered together, they were confused about the true nature of the universe and the plan of salvation and divine forethought and the strength of the authorities and everything the Savior was doing with them in the secret plan of salvation. Okay, so this is a, this is a loaded sentence here, but when you look at it, they have the true nature of the universe. They're wondering, like, what is going on? Remember, Jesus has died. Their friend, their savior, they've had an appearance before this of Jesus. He's talked to them. He's appeared before. But they're like, what the heck? I mean, imagine this. Let's say you're following a spiritual teacher, and they die, and they come back three days later. Now they've been giving spiritual guidance. They give more spiritual guidance when they come back. And then they're here and they're gone, right? Even if you can justify all that in your head, it sounds like crazy talk. It sounds like we're going to be on ancient aliens, right? Aliens, right? It sounds like that's what's going to happen. You're going to be on a History Channel special pretty soon. 
So they're wondering about everything. What they're saying here isn't just a laundry list. We're wondering about the plan of salvation. They're wondering, like, what do we do? This is crazy. And if you've ever had a spiritual experience in your life, this is a, this is a real response to spiritual experience. It's like you can be in the moment for a second and say, wow, I've, I've had this interaction with the divine. I've had a forethought of what's going to happen. I've had something happen. It's a big deal. But afterwards, you're like, what was that? And it takes a lot of time to develop the confidence to say, like, oh, that was an interaction with spirit. That was an interaction with God. That's what it is. The thing I want to point out of this section here, though, is the secret plan of salvation, okay? So this term, you might say, like, well, what does that really mean? Like, is this like a super secret, like, join the cult, get the decoder ring? Uh, not necessarily. What the Gnostic folks would believe is that it's a direct interaction with the divine. So what makes it secret is that not everybody can do it. It's not, again, secret to hide from you. It's just something that not everybody can access. And when you ac you access what they'd call the divine spark within you, I do have a Transformers reference I want to make right there as well, uh, but I'm not going to. We all spark. Come on. Someone's, someone understands Transformers. I hope you do. But this divine spark is within you. And when you activate it, it activates this power that allows you to see the world the way it really is and to manipulate the world to help it to grow, to heal people, etc. What makes them secret is that it's not like a, a plug and play. It's not saying like, oh, I got it, started reading this, check, like I can now access the divine. There are certain steps or activities that help you to do that. Prayer, meditation, you, um, the Gnostics would argue the um, sacraments, so receiving things like communion and so forth, are things that are all designed to help us uh, to access the divine. Let's make sure I'm missing anything in my notes. Now, you might also say this, well, if that's the case, if it's accessing the divine and activating the, dare I say, all spark, the uh, inside spark, again, two Transformers references, that's pretty winning, right? Uh, what, what happens to the cross? Well, at this point, the cross of Jesus wasn't the main point of the Gnostic faith. It was his life and, his, uh, and after the cross. But the cross does have a point. It's a meeting of the physical and material worlds and that Jesus is able to overcome all of that attachment to the physical world to be freed to that of spirit, to be someone who's fully connected to God the Father. Now, there's a lot more to God the Father. And uh, if you're right now thinking this sounds like not that far off from mainline Christianity, you just wait a little bit because we're not going to get to that tonight. Because when we do, you're going to be like, what the heck? It's crazy. It is a little crazy. And we might need a little flow chart for it, but we're going to get there. We're going to just do a couple more verses and then roll. Then the Savior appeared, not in his previous form, but in visible spirit. He looked like a great angel of light, but I must not describe his appearance. Most of the time, folks who've had spiritual experiences, at least recorded in scripture, as well as many who've recorded them in real life, the experience is almost what someone might say is ineffable or hard to describe. It's so unique that if we described our true spiritual experience, it might sound like something like you're on psychedelics uh, or something along those lines. You're having a, a hallucination of some kind. And that's really what they're saying here is that this angel light hand, I better not, I better not explain it because you're going to think I'm nuts. And I think many of us have been there before where you have an interaction with spirit that you're like, this is, this is just not explainable. And that's what happens uh, here. Mortal flesh could not bear it but only pure and perfect flesh, like what he taught us about in Galilee on the mountain called Olivet. So what's Olivet? So um, Olivet is, and again, this is probably where, I'll, we'll do one more verse after this just for kicks. But Olivet um, was where Jesus gave kind of these uh, three different diatribes on the end times. And what's interesting about it is those verses are less about end times, uh, which is something I'd always believe, and more about a big shift and change in consciousness. And to really interact and face those challenges, you have to have your life pure. And that's what he's calling on, is to interact with spirit, that you're listening to the guidance of spirit on what to do and what not to do. Very interesting. So that's what uh, he's talking about, that they that this this appearance was akin to some um, someone who would need to address those challenges of evolution. The next phrase here, and then we'll end. He said, peace be with you, my peace I give to you. They all marveled and were afraid. 
Okay, so peace be with you is used four times in mainline scripture. I will tell you it's very difficult to get any commentary on these. And, and just as an aside, I can't find any commentaries that do what we're doing. In normal Christian land, um, if you want to talk about Genesis or you want to talk about John or any of those Gospels, there's hundreds, I, I dare say hundreds, at least tens, probably hundreds of commentaries you can get, yeah, for sure hundreds of commentaries you can get on Kindle alone, never mind free online. There's nothing like that for these. So a lot of this requires just a lot more research. Um, and again, doing the best I can. I'm not saying that it's uh, perfect, but we're doing the best we can. But in this case, uh, there are four times in the main scripture um, that he says, peace be with you. And it's a common greeting. But why would he say it like this? He says, you know, but peace be with you, my peace I give you. They marveled and they were afraid. Jesus isn't there to cause fear. He's not showing up in this light form to scare us, to um, not want to interact with them. Remember, this is the guy who children came to him and they were like trying to shoo the kids away. And they're like, no, let the kids come to me, right? He's someone who cares about everyone. Again, we talked about him raising the status of women earlier tonight. Here he wants peace to be with you. And what does that mean in your life? When Jesus comes into it, it's not to... Um, turn everything upside down it's to bring a newfound peace and to rely on god to direct your life to listen to the light inside of you to activate that light so that you too can do miracles he would say that you can follow after me he said come follow me right but in this case this is showing what the way of peace to allow you to do the things he did by following after him i think that's a good place to end today i actually went further than i thought i would which is um, crazy and uh, next time we're going to continue with this. We're going to take this very slow. We're going to go through each part. And the goal is for you to understand what's going on and to understand the Gnostic way of life. This is going to get really crazy fast. So you might say like, oh, there's again, nothing new here. Come back next week, please. Um, because this is going to be really interesting. So with that in mind, let me give you, um, say a prayer for you, give you a blessing, and then we'll be on our way. And again, thanks for everybody back in Elizabeth. Sorry I'm not there to help with the discussion. Uh, hopefully this is helpful tonight. I will have to do this at the end of the month too. I think that's my last travel till March. So let me say a prayer, give you a blessing, and let you guys get on with it. God, thank you so much for the ability to meet virtually tonight as I travel. Pray for everyone listening, that you'd be with them, that you guide them, keep them safe. I ask that you'd activate their light inside of them so they can be a light in a dark world, that they can bring love and joy everywhere they go. Be with them, Lord. Amen. And I just pray the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be on you, guide you, direct you, be with you, and just activate your heart so that you might be filled with his light. Amen.